Not many ministers in the room were offered a peat bog as part of their compensation, but it was one of the joys of being the most northerly minister in Her Majesty's domain um, and uh, left an indelible impression on my life. I mean the island on which I serve, not the peat bog, <laughs> since I didn't know how you work a peat bog, and most of you don't know what a peat bog is. <laughs> I think we should just depart from the subject of peat bogs, but the <laughs> island uh, was indeed called Unst. Now, we've had a, a long and uh, thrilling day. We, we had some moments of excitement, even in the question and answer session. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, gird up the loins of your minds uh, once again this evening. And if you will, turn in Scripture to the opening chapter of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, where I'll read a few verses and then some more verses in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, uh, our overarching theme is overcoming the world, and the title I've been allotted for this session has been framed in uh, fairly familiar words to us, I believe there a quotation from a hymn, This is My Father's World. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And so on through the beginning of verse 26, when God has punctuated time with the wonders of His creation and seen that everything is good. Then God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image, in the image of God He created him, male and female He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In some ways, Genesis chapter 1 is the view of creation from eternity, and Genesis chapter 2 brings us to a different camera angle and begins to speak about the story of history. And this is introduced in chapter 2 and verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there He put the man whom He had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in verse 15, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I've come over the years in reading the New Testament to believe that almost certainly, not least because there is only one apostle who ever refers to what we in this room profess to be, there is only one apostle who ever speaks of believers as Christians. It is not a term that passed through the Apostle Paul's lips as he dictated letters or through his writing instrument in the letters that he personally wrote. We have no evidence whatsoever from the New Testament that the Apostle Paul actually ever called somebody a Christian, and that on the three occasions the term is used in the New Testament, it is almost certainly at the beginning as it is becoming again today, a pejorative, demeaning term. Christ's ones spat out in the face of believers. And there is something in many ways, I think, to some of us, God willing, to many of us here in the midst of the pain and inner burdens that we feel in the characteristics engrossing our society today there is also something of a thrill that passes through the Christian in an antagonistic world to be able to read the New Testament with fresh lenses in his or her spectacles and understand that there is a call today to live the kind of Christian life that is actually described for us in the pages of Scripture and biblically instructed and clear-thinking Christians will therefore in our age as well as in any other age be particularly characterized by joy and thankfulness and not by complaint and lamentation and withdrawal from the world. Christians will understand that the outpouring of the Lord Jesus expressed in the text that governs the theme of our conference together, that our Lord Jesus in the midst of the crisis for His disciples was filling them with a sense of joy, filling them with a sense of divine peace, filling them with a profound sense of the glory of God. So thankfulness, joyfulness, a sense of the victory of Jesus Christ are keynotes of those who are in this world demeaned by being described as Christians. And we understand, many of us I am sure, that all of this is undergirded by an amazing principle that is given to us from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, that this world with all its hazards 
is actually a safe place exclusively for Christian people to live in, that we understand from Scripture that our God, our Father, works everything together in the universe for the good of His people, for those who have been called according to His purpose, that our lives are sacred and secure until God's time for us to be called home has come. And so, as we walk out into the world, as the author of this hymn, This Is My Father's World, apparently frequently used to do, we are able to say, no matter what the day may bring, what persecution there may be, what opposition we may face, what demeaning may be our experience, I am going out today into my Father's world. And we are trying to examine this whole theme of living the Christian life in an alien and antagonistic world, learning what it means to be alien residents in this world by thinking, yes, apologetically about how do we analyze the movements in society and respond to them. Yes, as we shall do, God willing, in the morning with Dr. Godfrey's address on Athanasius, historically, what did it mean for our fathers to stand against the world? And in these other addresses, we are wanting to think about this biblically. And the task assigned to me, as I understand it, is to come back to some absolutely basic foundations for living the Christian life in a world like this, where the gospel is demeaned, where Christians are marginalized, and where there seem to be dark clouds on the horizon, so that we are able to walk out into the world with our heads held high, absolutely surrounded by a sense of dignity and otherworldly peace as we move into this world so that we appear to men and women to be men and women who live as though this actually were our Father's world. And I want us to try and think a little about this together in terms of the teaching that we're given here in the opening chapters of the Bible. So important for us, isn't it, to have a big framework of reference to catch the big picture. They say, don't they, that over the last several decades, the most common title for poetry written by teenagers is, Who Am I? And it's one of the glories of the Christian gospel that right from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, it brings to bear upon us the answer to that question. And it is a most striking and glorious thing for a young or older Christian to live in this world, no matter what our vacation and vocation may be, as somebody who knows who he or she is, because they understand that they live in the world that has been created by their Father. Many of the great philosophers, certainly of the more recent centuries, have suggested in their writings, not necessarily uh, Christian thinkers, but people who have tried to take reality seriously, who have said, you know, the most fundamental question of all philosophical questions. You get this kind of thing in Leibniz and more recently in Heidegger and uh, in uh, other thinkers like Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, the most fundamental question of all is why is it that there is something and not nothing? Ludwig Wittgenstein confided once in a friend that there were moments in his life where he simply felt overwhelmed by the reality that there is actually a reality. And 
in their own way, our, our great scientists have been trying to probe the same issue. In public, they may say to us, all we are interested in is describing the reality that is there. But you notice, especially with some of the greatest thinkers, with the most extraordinary, especially mathematical and uh, physical skills, I mean, skills in understanding the varied operations of the universe, that there is a drive that lies behind them, and that drive is to get back, as it were, to some kind of alpha moment or alpha explanation of things that will allow us to continue to speak about a universe. The very notion of a universe indicates coherence. It indicates system. It actually indicates reason, which is why some of these thinkers have become so concerned that the barren fruit of their godless thinking must mean that they can no longer speak about a universe, and therefore the whole fabric of the ground underneath their thinking begins to shake and tremble and quake. And uh, the most amazing thing in the world to me, I think about it so often, is that the youngest, the newest, the, the least taught Christian believer who opens the pages of Scripture knows the answer to the question, is not foolish or arrogant enough to say that they know as much as some of the great minds of history, but that they know something about everything, and it is the key to all that all things have their being, because as these opening verses of Genesis teach us, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's not an accident that those words open the Bible. That's the key to answering the question, why is there something and not nothing? And the key to answering the question, who am I in the midst of this extraordinary cosmos? And so, the simplest believer from the beginning of Scripture is given the clue to everything in the world. This is my Father's world. He is the one who has made it. That's not incidentally a first-rate poetry, is it? But it is first-rate theology. And it is, don't you think, in this world in which we live, the most wonderfully stabilizing reality in our Christian lives that our God has made the universe, and that He has told us in His Word that His purpose and desire from the beginning is that in everything He does, He would display Himself to be nothing less than a Father. This is not just our God's world, this is my Father's world. And I want us to take a few minutes this evening to try and explore from a biblical point of view just exactly what does it mean then to say on the basis of Scripture, this is my Father's world. Because of course the Scripture uses that title for God in several different dimensions in a series of concentric circles with distinct nuances. And there are three of these nuances, three of these concentric circles that are particularly relevant for us, I think, as Christians. The first is the one that is emphasized in Genesis and frequently emphasized in the pages of the Old Testament Scriptures. It's the emphasis that we express whenever we say the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty the Father who has brought all things into being. So, at one level, when we speak about Him as our Father, we mean that He is the Father of the creation He has brought into being. 
and this is what the opening pages of the Bible are intended to teach us. Now, in my own view, the opening pages of the Bible say extraordinarily little about the mechanisms by which God brought things into being. It gives us these basic descriptions of God speaking but it tells us nothing about the physics and the chemistry involved in the speaking of God that brought into being the wonders of the world. And I think there's a very simple explanation for that. It seems to me to be quite obvious. And that is that if God had given me a book of scientific equations of the principles of physics and chemistry that He had employed in bringing this world into being, I at least would have had to be forced to close the book. <laughs> My own conviction is that there is not a scientist in the universe who wouldn't to a certain degree also share that. Don't you understand how often scientists say, we're just telling it the way it is? And I want to say to that, but um, what I see there is not an equation. So, no, you are using, uh, you're using human language, you're often using metaphor, and you are usually engaged in philosophy in your attempts to describe how things are and what they are. And uh, that's not the same thing as telling me what reality is. I remember on occasion uh, a colleague that uh, Dr. Godfrey had and I enjoyed in seminary whose first doctorate was in mathematics. He had taught mathematics. He had then gone on to study theology. He came back from a study leave, and part of the deal was you would give a report to the faculty and he was giving his report to the faculty. He had been interested in questions of the engagement of science and uh, biblical theology, and in the course of his presentation, he had some PowerPoint presentations, and this vast equation flashed up on the screen, filled about 60% uh, of the screen. All these funny Greek squiggles and bits up and down, and uh, the whole room full of PhDs burst into near hysterical laughter. And our friend said, now that, he said, is the equation for the Milky Way. And as soon as the word way was out of his mouth, another PowerPoint appeared on the screen, a picture of the Milky Way by courtesy of the Hubble telescope. He said, now that is the Milky Way. Do you understand that in the very nature of the case, our science is descriptive and by nature it is always reductionistic. I found myself laughing at the equation and full of awe at the picture of the Milky Way. Even I, in my limited understanding, knew that this was just some kind of human metaphorical language to try to describe this awesome wonder. And of course, the reason why unbelieving scientists are so fascinated with these things is because it protects them from the sense of awe and wonder. It protects them from the sense that rises within even their unbelieving souls that says, somebody needs to be praised for this. But they have nobody to praise. There is nowhere for the thankfulness and awe and amazement and wonder of their soul to go. They have to suppress it and repress it. And so often, as you will notice in the media, when they were interviewed, they would, they would seek to do everything they could to prevent interviewers from probing into that sense of wonder and desire to say, thank you for this the very kind of thing that Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 1. And what Genesis 1 and 2 is 
saying to us in its marvelous way, I think, among the many other things it's saying to us is this. Here is God telling you something about the marvel of His creation. And it is your privilege because He gives you dominion. It is your privilege with that as your framework to go forth and explore the cosmos that He has given to you so that no matter what your vocation may be, for example, in the hard sciences or in the, in the life sciences, to understand that in everything you do, you are moving ag- around God's creation. And as uh, Kepler, the great astronomer, said, you are trying in your human language and limited ability to think God's thoughts after Him. Remember how one of the hymns says that there is something that appears in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen. And it's such a wonderful thing that Genesis is telling us here that God who has created this has created it as a Father. And marvelous to see how He does it. I mean, this is so obvious in the passage, isn't it, that He he brings into being this primeval stuff. It's very unusually described, isn't it? In verses 1 and 2, God creates the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. What was that first act of creation like? What was an earth that was formless and void and dark like? And then this marvelous sentence that is so reminiscent, isn't it, for New Testament Christians of the way in which Luke, who is so interested in Old Testament history, the way in which we read in the conception of our Lord Jesus Christ that the Spirit of God was brooding over the darkness of the womb of the Virgin Mary to bring into being the head of the new creation, as it were, redoing and reworking what He had done at the beginning of creation. And so, in a way, these are signals that lead us to expect that what will follow from this will be in this marvelous design of God that where there has been darkness, there will be a flood of light. Where there has been formlessness, there will be form. And you can almost see the way in which God begins to create form of this mass of stuff, how He separates light from the darkness, how He separates water from land how He then begins to fill these various aspects, compartments of His creation with, with creatures that are, are, are appropriate to their environment. Birds with wings that fly, giraffes with necks that stretch to the trees, extraordinary creatures that live under the water, hidden creatures, creatures man has never seen because he is doing all this for his pleasure and for his glory and for the joy of his Son. This is to be his Son's playroom, as it were. These these are to be not soft toys, but living animals in the playroom of His beloved Son. And our privilege is that He lets us into the playroom. Did you ever have this experience? Perhaps you were brought up somewhere where you were, you looked over at your neighbor, and little Johnny always seemed to have more than you had. And then there were times when, when you could go into His playroom, and He would share His toys. And this is, this is what God does as 
He fills this world with objects and creatures of extraordinary beauty. But when you stand back from all this, I think it becomes clear what it is that God is doing. And some of the connections in the Bible, I think, make this even clearer. The connections there seem to be between creation and then the creation of the tabernacle and the creation of the temple. And when you get right to the end of the Bible, which in my day in school was always the place to go if you wanted to know the answers to the questions that arose at the front of the book, it eventually dawns on you that what God has actually been creating here is a cathedral. Yes, there was a tabernacle and a temple, but what He was creating here was a cathedral that was full of light. And in that cathedral, the most amazing congregation of birds flying in the air in the, in the upper choir chamber of the cathedral, and these, these fish and sea creatures that, uh, as it were, played around at the at the bottom of the cathedral, and then the staff of the cathedral, these great animals that roamed through the vegetation that God had created, He has brought a congregation into being. That's why right at the end of the book of Psalms, these great Psalms of praise, what do they do? They call on everything that has breath to praise the Lord. And the birds of the air have breath the fish of the sea have breath, the animals of the fields have breath. And so in Psalm 148, the psalmist is calling upon all the members of the congregation to come and in unison sing in the praises of the Creator Father who has brought them into being. And this is why the, the Psalter comes to its end with this cry, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord! Except there's something missing, isn't there? At least if you're Presbyterian, there's something missing. <laughs> and we've early indications in the Bible that uh, the early church was Presbyterian. Moses had elders and all the rest of it. So, and of course, they are reading this in the light of the Exodus. What's the language Presbyterians use here? there's a vacancy. There is a vacancy in this cathedral. There is the need for a senior minister in this cathedral. And so, as the climax of Genesis 1 emerges, what's the story? Here, amazingly, God, as it were, has looked into this stuff that He has created like a great sculptor, and He has seen what He will bring forth from it. So, in a sense, He looks outside of Himself in order to bring forth the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the great sea creatures and all that surrounds them. But he says, if we're going to have a minister in this church, it's going to need to be somebody who is made in our image and in our likeness. And he will be the one so like us in miniature, so able to understand us in miniature, so marked by so much of what we experience as the ever-blessed Trinity, Creator Father, brooding Spirit, speaking Word, that this senior minister will be able to gather together under the authority of the Word, the praises of the people of God for the glory of our name. I, you know… There, there must have been something, if one can say this about the sheer mystery of the inner life of God, there must have been such fun in the Trinity, such joy in the Trinity, such thrill in the Trinity, that creating someone, not some animal or something, but someone beyond the Trinity 
who at the same time had a likeness to the God in whose image he had been made and was able to lead the choir and congregation of that creation so that everything that has life and breath would be able to praise the Lord. And so he comes and he makes man as his own image. He is the father of the creation he brings into being. But more particularly now, focusing now on this man and woman he is making in the wonder of his creation. He is not only the father of the creation he brings into being, he is the father of, notice the language, the sons whom he makes in his image. Now, I use that term sons not in the gender sense, but in the biblical sense, the sons who will inherit, the meek who will inherit the earth, and He's giving the earth to them as their inheritance. He, he spreads it all out before them, doesn't He? But it's the language of being children that I think is so significant here. He's Father as Creator, but He's also Father of children. I say that for a couple of reasons. One, because I think that is part of the point that Luke makes, isn't it, in his genealogy of Jesus just before Jesus' baptism when he's describing who Jesus is, and he traces Jesus back, not like Matthew to Abraham, but right back to Adam. And he traces Jesus back to Adam in terms of the relationship between sons and fathers. And then he describes Adam as the Son of God. Not the Son of God in the eternal trinity, but the Son of God in the miniature of creation. And this, I think, is undoubtedly the reason why when you turn over a couple of pages in your Bible and we are told, as it were, of a new beginning in creation, we're told that there is this amazing event takes place in Genesis chapter 5, and in verses 1 to 3, God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. And then, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son as his likeness. Now, you understand what's being said here. In, in the in the work of the great Creator, He's making a son in His likeness, just as part of the privilege of the image is to make a son in His likeness. So, this language of likeness to God in the Scriptures, this language of likeness to God is family language. Uh, I have three sons and a daughter, and it happens uh, marginally to her irritation, that so many people, when they meet me, then say to her, you look so like your dad. The, for some strange reason, they seem to think that's a compliment, but she doesn't really <laughs> regard it as a compliment about the relationship to the father that she loves, but she is in apparently my likeness. And this is what Genesis is saying to us, that when God makes the miniature, when the Trinity say, let us make man as our image and our likeness, they really mean, let us, let us, let us make them with the kind of relationship to us that will reflect the particular relationship there is in the bond of the Holy Spirit between myself as Father and the eternal Word as Son. And it's the most amazing thing. It's, it's our heavenly connection, isn't it? And the whole passage then into Genesis 2 goes on to express to us what this means. It means, for example, if Genesis 2, 7 is anything to go by, that He makes the man, let's just call these, uh, these ones the man, He makes the man in Genesis 2 for communion with Himself. 
This is why you can't really understand Genesis chapter 1 unless you read it alongside Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1 says, let's make man as our image, and so he makes him as his image, male and female. But Genesis 2 tells us how he did it. And the language clearly is what we would call anthropomorphic. But we mustn't think anthropomorphic means it isn't really true. What anthropomorphic means is we are describing this in human terms, but it's something even more amazing than that. And the picture is of God actually stooping down into the dust, into the slime. So, do you think it's kind of crazy that, uh, that uh, people say as though they were going to surprise us? You know there are bits of apes that are like bits of men? He says, yes, we're made of the same stuff. I didn't know you Christians believed that. Oh, yes, we believe that. We've believed it for thousands of years because we've read about it in the Bible. We're all made of the dust. But God has come down into the dust. He didn't just speak into the dust. He, he comes, what can that mean? And He makes this man. It's almost as though Genesis is saying to us, you need to understand that there is an intimacy here in the creation of the man and then of the woman that exists in the creation of nothing else. And then God does this, which is to me so amazing and so profoundly poignant and moving. He kisses the dirt into life. Dare we even put it this way, that once God has created man, there's dust on His face. But this is, this is an expression of His love. It's all and again, I say this is anthropomorphic language, but the reality is much greater, not lesser, than the picture, that He has made us for the most intimate communion with Himself. He's kissed us into life. It's an expression of the most amazing love that He has for us, that He's created us for face-to-face -face communion with Himself. And this is the message of the New Testament, isn't it? It shows us the glory of what has been lost. It speaks about the Word who was face to face with the Father, coming and being face to face with us so that we might be transformed into the likeness of the Son so that we might be able to see God face to face again because He's made us for this intimate communion with Himself. And then because He is a God of infinite, eternal, tri-personal companionship, He makes the man and the woman for creative companionship. Oh, this is the tragedy of being a professing secular humanist when your child is born, that you participate in the creation of another human being someone who is like yourself, and you are awestruck by the wonder of the privilege. It is too much for any man or any woman to take in, but God has made us for creative companionship because He's made us as His likeness as well as His image. He wants… if He's going to have glorious fellowship with us, there are things that we need to be able to share with Him, things that we can talk about with Him as a father and a son so that we can say to Him, it, is, it must be, a, I worship and adore You because you're, you're the Creator of everything, and I think I understand the joy of that to You because You've given me the privilege of, oh my God, how good You have been to me of creating another human being and if you're a Christian, of creating another human being who will last for all eternity. And that's, that's what He wants. He not only wants intimacy with us, but He 
wants us to have creative companionship, and this is one illustration of it. And then He gives them this abundant provision, this provision for everything here. If you want to be an astronomer, there's provision. If you want to try and build a spaceship, there's provision. If you want to build an ark, there's wood. If you want to examine tiny insects, they're there. If you want to grow things, you can grow things. If you want to make things, you can make things. Because uh, He's made provision for our mental, intellectual, and yes, also our physical satisfaction. Every single tree that He makes is beautiful. Every fruit-bearing tree, it looks delicious to the taste. It's His provision for us. And then not only provision for our satisfaction, but provision for our growth in relationship with Him. And that's the significance of these trees, isn't it? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which looks like the other trees, apparently. We're told it's described in the same way. It looks… it's beautiful, and its fruit looks delicious. It's like these other trees. But He has said, don't eat the fruit of that tree because He's saying to the man and to the woman, now, you see He's a Father. I sing now, dear ones, I want you to show me that you love me by refusing to eat the fruit of that tree for only one reason, not because it's ugly fruit, not because it's a twisted tree, but because your Father told you not to eat the fruit. And you're going to say to one another, well, honey, has Father ever told us to do anything for our harm? And what happens every time you're tempted and you say, but Father has another way for me, and you walk past the tree, you're stronger. It's like the hymn, each victory will help you, some other to win. And so they're there to grow, just like later on our Lord Jesus has tests, and He grows through the tests. And through the tests, His Father's favor apparently grows. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. The Father loved Him, but then the Father saw how obedient He was, and the Father said to Him, I've always loved you, but how I love you for this obedience. So that as I sometimes think, as His Son died in obedience on the cross, the Heavenly Father was quietly saying to Himself, it would have been too much for the angels of heaven to understand, perhaps, if ever I loved you. My Jesus, tis now. And He made us for this, for this spiritual growth and this spiritual fellowship with Him. And He gave us this remarkable vocation of having dominion. I, I love those words that uh, Kepler said in great days. He says, we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it therefore benefits us and befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather, above all else, of the glory of God. It's all created to make us see what a gracious and generous Heavenly Father He really is. And He makes this man and this woman to be the gardeners of creation. I think Americans often get this better than Scottish people. I first brought my family here to the United States in, I think, 1981. We were in a home, I think it was in Florida, and I said to our hosts, we had three very small boys and a tiny daughter, I said to our hosts, would it be all right if my boys go and play in your garden. And I saw this look of absolute horror <laughs> come over the wife's face. 
It wasn't as though my boys were wearing kilts or blue paint or anything like that. <laughs> and then eventually, I just kind of remembered the difference in language. As far as I was concerned, the garden's the bit of grass at the back of the house. As far as she was concerned, the garden was her roses and all the rest of it and the idea of our boys playing in the garden. See, I didn't distinguish between what you Americans call the garden and the yard. <laughs> but in this respect, Americans are right, because when God brings this world into its position for them, there is both garden and yard. Now, I sometimes think when people read Genesis chapters 1 and 2, they don't grasp this. The whole world was not yet garden. God planted it. This is a father. He said, I want you to be a gardener. And so, I'm going to give you a little start. Now, you do the rest. And so, they are to extend this garden, I think, in every conceivable sense horticulturally, scientifically, in every conceivable sense, this is why they need to multiply and increase, because their task is to extend the borders of this garden to the ends of the earth. That's why the Bible ends with such a garden, where the whole place is temple. There is no temple in the new earth because the whole place is temple. And that was the challenge that they were given, the life that was set before them. And He had made everything in the cosmos so that that could be true. Some of you will know the name of a very famous English uh, mathematician, scientist, Sir John Polkinghorne. Uh, he was professor of, I think, astronomical physics at the University of Cambridge, and at the pinnacle, a, a world thinker and leader. And when he was about 50-something, uh, he went into the Christian ministry. And it was sensational, this in enormous intellect, going into the Christian ministry. What's the meaning of the sacrifice of the intellect in pursuing a, a ministry? And uh, uh, BBC, I think it was, sent rather naively sent along a young reporter who uh, had obviously no idea how brilliant this man was or how, how, how clearly committed he was to being a reasonable, thinking Christian. And he said, but surely, uh, surely, Professor Polkinghorne, uh, somebody like you realizes the vastness of the universe. You've all these mathematical equations. How can you possibly profess a Christian faith that places man at the center of things? And uh, I remember Polkinghorn saying very graciously to him, I don't think you understand that it's the vastness of the universe that is the necessary prerequisite for the existence of man. Somebody said to me the other day that they had read somewhere that if all the bees died in the world, it would only be a few years before the world would cease to be fruitful. It's as magnificently balanced as that, and He creates us in the broadest sense of the term to be the gardeners, to finish the job. That incidentally is why when Christ finishes the job, He tells His disciples to go and garden the world with the gospel. That's why the gospel promises is that the meek shall inherit the earth. And this is the privilege of knowing that this is our Heavenly Father's world. Well, that leads us in just for a moment to consider this third circumference. Yes, God is the Father who brings creation into being. God is the Father who makes a son in His image. And thirdly, God is a Father who continues to love the prodigal. We read in chapter 3 now of the way in which the man and the woman stray 
from the command of God and the family of God and bring down in their train the whole human race. A curse comes on the earth. Instead of being the gardener who has dominion over the yard and its dust, Adam actually becomes part of the dust over which he was intended to have dominion. That's the tragedy of death, that every body we lay in the grave that will become part of the dust of the earth was intended to be the gardener of creation in all its multi-dimensions. And although God gives His promise, the story gets worse and we have the flood, and God gives this amazing promise that He's going to hold the thing in being because He is going to fulfill the promise of Genesis 3.15, and things get even worse. There is a babel, a desire as we see today to climb up to heaven and tear God down from the heavens. And we'll come to how God remedies this tomorrow, but let me just fast forward to give us a glimpse to just, uh, just to look beyond the curtain of the future and tear back the curtain and get a glimpse of the wonderful thing that God does for His prodigals in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ. You remember that day, early morning, there is a woman comes to the garden tomb, and she senses the presence of another as she is both awestruck and paralyzed, really, by the fact that the tomb is empty. And we're told what was going through her mind, and then we're told words that Jesus spoke to her. What was going through her mind was she supposed him to be the gardener, and so she said, if you've taken his body away, tell me where you've put it. And then Jesus says to us, Mary, don't hold on to me. I'm going to ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. I sometimes think as we read these verses, we make three mistakes. The first mistake is the last mistake. We think that Jesus is distinguishing in His words there between our relationship and His relationship. But no, what He's saying there is that He has come as the second man and the last Adam to bring us back to where the first man and the first Adam was to be able to call Him what you know no single individual believer in the Old Testament ever really said when they came before God, you are my Father. But the other mistakes were mistakes that we make as well as Mary makes. She was wrong on two counts. He wasn't the gardener and he hadn't taken the body, because he had taken the body. And he was actually the gardener. And that day when he stepped out of the tomb into that little garden that in the marvel of God's economic providence, he was saying almost as it were to his son, just as there was a garden at the beginning, there's going to be a garden at the new beginning. And as He steps out, He truly is the gardener. Everything, as He says in the Great Commission, is now under His dominion. We don't yet see, as Hebrew says, everything under man's dominion, but we do see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because He has suffered for His people and risen in order to lead many sons to glory. And that's our privilege. That's why we can go out of this, what we call sanctuary, and know 
that we are safe in the world outside because this is my Father's world, and we praise Him for it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day that You've given to us and for the blessings of Your Word and the privilege of being with fellow believers and being strengthened in and through the Word of the Gospel for the counsel that You give to us, the strengthening that You provide for us, the blessings that You offer to us. But tonight, as though we were one great multiplied thousand family of brothers and sisters, we come into Your presence, and we are bold to call You our Heavenly Father. With all our hearts, we worship You. Thank You for the privileges You have given to us, for helping us to understand who You are, and therefore to know who we are, and we yield ourselves with joy that we may serve You to the praise of Your glorious grace. And this we pray in Your Son, our Savior's name. Amen.